know that it's really good sometimes to leave room for the Holy Spirit because the Spirit should be fluid and be able to speak. So I'm going to ask you to kind of bear with me because this is, this is the third part of a series that we had started that was entitled Growing in Grace. If you recall, we did part one and part two. But this part three is going to be a little bit different than what I thought part three was going to be. Uh, again, I'm going to read a very special blessing over this church that Paul blessed the Ephesian church with. And I want to permeate you with this blessing. And this blessing is found in Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm starting to read in verse 14. And I want you to open your hearts because this is a, a, a pastoral blessing that I am pronouncing over your life. In verse 14... Paul says to the Ephesian church, and Pastor Frank says to Greater Bridgeport Christian Fellowship, For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might, through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Father, as I pray this prayer over the, this congregation today, I want to thank you for how you are preparing us. I want to thank you for your precious word and how it is filling us up, how it is just connecting the dots, how... We're learning who we are in you. And Lord, I pray today that what you've been showing us as a congregation will begin to come together in wonderful ways in the lives and the hearts of people here in this place. Lord, I pray for every heart to be open today. I pray, Lord, even now that every spiritual eye will be laid open and that you, Holy Spirit, would enlighten our spiritual eyes that something inside of someone in this place would literally leap with joy, would leap in agreement with what's being spoken here. And Lord, as I speak your word, let there be inner agreement with it, Lord God, that everyone would know this is what the Lord is saying at this time. Now, Lord, we stand here ready to receive what it is that you have for us. Lord, again, I, I, I hide behind you, and I allow you and your word to be fully expressed in this place. Now, Lord, simply have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like uh, for us to direct our attention to Psalm 42, and I'm going to read it uh, from the New American Standard. And I'm going to read it in its entirety, and we're going to just comment on some of the things that uh, is going on here. Psalm 42. It is a psalm that uh, is given credit to the sons of Korah. It's not a psalm of David. But I want you to listen to the words of this author as he is deeply, genuinely going through something very, very deep in his life. Psalm 42 starts as follows. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember, and I pour out my soul with them, before I used to go along with the throngs and lead them in procession to the house of God. 
with a voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. O my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Bizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God my wreck, my God my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do you go mourning because of the impression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Now this particular psalm was written by a psalmist, a person that was in a lot of trouble. And this person probably was in exile. We're not sure it wasn't the Babylonian exile because the place that he mentions, Mount, Mount Mizor, is north of Jerusalem. But this is a person that lived in Jerusalem that was familiar with the temple, was familiar with worship, the house of God. And he talks about how he remembers how he used to, 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 to lead people into the house of the Lord, how they used to go in and sing worship songs. And, and he's comparing that, and he's saying how beautiful that is, but he's also remembering where he is now. And he's drawing the, 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 he's drawing the two of them together, and he's looking at them. And this is the cry of a man that knows the Lord. This is the cry of someone who, who knows what it is to be in a worship service. This is the cry of someone who could have possibly been in Greater Bridgeport Christian Fellowship experiencing sweet worship, yet now they're experiencing something that is so hopeless that they can't seem to make the two come together. They can't seem to understand how the two could possibly coexist. And that leads us to the question, why does God allow us to experience seemingly hopeless situations? Why is it that God would allow us to experience seemingly hopeless situations? Well, you know, God is God, and if he wanted to, he could simply lift us up off of the ground bring us through life without any troubles, without any problems, without anything going on, and deliver us safely in heaven, and everything would be okay. But that doesn't happen. In the real, genuine world, the world of people, the world where evil is, where we are, the reality of the fact is, is that we experience things that could bring us to a hopeless place. We're not exempt from that. As a matter of fact, we are supposed to be the hope in a hopeless world. So we're not exempt from hope. We're not exempt from hopelessness or facing hopelessness. Now, I believe that every time that we face a hopeless situation, we make a choice. We either give in and allow ourselves to be overwhelmed, or in the face of hopelessness, we choose hope. It's a conscious choice that we make. And what is hope? It's a clear scene of reality full of expectancy and assurance of his good intentions towards us. It's a clear seeing of reality full of expectancy and assurance. And because our hope is rooted in the resurrection of Christ from the dead, our hope is always sure. Please understand that. We don't hope as the world hopes. We talked about this the last couple of times. Our hope is rooted in something real and genuine and sure. Our hope 
comes from the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Done deal. It's done already. That's what our hope is based on. And because our hope is rooted there, we can say that our hope is sure. We face the unexpected with an expectancy for good. Did you hear what I said? We face the unexpected things that come into our life, but we face them not as the world would face them, to be bowled over and to allow it to roll over us, but we face them with the expectancy of good somehow coming out of it because our hope is sure. And how do we do that? Well, this psalm that we just read, Psalm 42, the writer compares himself to a thirsty deer panting for water, longing for the life-given presence of God. He's saying, you know, God, the same way that that deer pants for water, his, he's heaving, his sides are going in and out, and he knows that he needs water. He's saying, that's the same way I am. I know that I need you in this situation. Now, you know, every image that I found of a, of a deer panting for water, they always show this little cute doe, and he's by the water, and he's drinking water. But if you read the psalm carefully, he's saying as the deer pants for the water. He didn't say the deer had any water. He's saying the deer is thinking about water, and because he's thinking about water, the thought of the water is actually making his body go through convulsions because he knows how badly he needs the water. And the psalmist is saying the same thing. He says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. He's saying, as I'm going through this hopeless situation, I know, I, I know what the goodness of God is. I was there. I, was, I, I, I experienced sweet worship. I experienced sweet fellowship. I experienced the presence of God. I know that God is real. And in the midst of this, he's saying, that's how, my soul, that's how much my soul longs for you, O oh God, in the midst of all this. He's longing for the life-giving presence of God, and he makes a choice. Do you understand? He makes a choice. Please understand that. We have the ability, when faced with a hopeless situation, to make a choice. You see, we live in a world to whereas we've kind of been told by society, we've kind of been told by everyone around us that, that life kind of happens to us. And you kind of get used to hearing that, so you kind of get used to it. Life just happens. Well, that's not what I read in Scripture. What I read in Scripture is the fact that, yes, life may happen to you, but as a believer, because we have hope, we don't have to lay down and allow life to roll over us and say, well, that's just the way it is. You see, life happens to up, us, and you know what we do? We get up, we dust ourselves off, and we happen to life. You have the ability to happen to life. That means that what life throws you, you don't have to fall down and allow it to happen. Listen, folks, you have a living hope. Remember we read in Peter a couple of weeks ago? that we have a living hope through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a living hope. We don't have to kind of hope things work out. We have a genuine, real, living hope, Peter calls it, a living hope. And because of that, sometimes, you know, I don't care how it looks. I don't care how it feels sometimes. We have to know that our hope is realer than whatever we're facing and that this is not the end. And we need to get up and happen to life sometimes. Because you, do you know who lives inside of you? Father, Son, and Spirit is alive inside of you. They said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You know what that means? That means that you never face one situation in which God isn't there with you. He's in the middle of your darkness right now, working it out from the inside out. We never face hopelessness, folks. We don't face hopelessness as the world faces hopelessness. You have a living hope inside of you. Yes, things go wrong. Yes, we get tragic phone calls that a loved one's been murdered. But you know what? It's not the end of the road. It's not something that should leave us hopeless. 
is something that, 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 that in the face of that, we need to realize that our hope is still alive, that our hope is real, that our hope is genuine, that our hope hasn't diminished because of what the world is saying or because of what the world has thrown at us. You know, we make that choice to be present to hope. Now, please understand what I'm saying when I say present to hope, because to be present to hope and expectancy is to reject what you might be feeling. That means that there is another choice. Do you understand? Now, I got my feelings over here, and don't get me wrong, feelings are very good, but feelings are very deceiving. How many people know that feelings can be deceiving? Something can, <laughs> someone knows, I saw that. Here. Listen to me, feelings can be deceiving. I can't bank on my feelings. You can't bank on your feelings. You know why? Because they change all the time. You could get up today and you could feel great. Guess what? The barometer changes and there's more, more uh, uh, moisture in the air and you wake up tomorrow and, oh, wow, I'm, I'm hurting. Okay, feelings change all the time, so we can't go by feelings. Now, what I said was this. We make a conscious decision to be present to the hope that we know is there, or we kind of just allow that feeling to take over and we kind of give in to it. And when you give in to your feelings, you're at the mercy of your feelings. We have to be present to the hope and the expectancy, so what do we have to do? We have to reject sometimes what you might be feeling. I have to tell myself, I don't care how you feel about it, I know that this is not the end of the story. I don't care what everybody else around me may think. I know the end of the story, and that's not it. I don't care how many people, like the psalmist said, comes up to me and says, where's your God? I don't care how many say that. I know that he's alive and real and working inside of me. You see, in such a situation, your number one priority is to be conscious, aware, and alive to the presence of God in that real moment. Remember, God is with you right now in the only present moment that you know, and that's right now. God is not into yesterday. Now, God will be there tomorrow, but you're not there yet. We have to live in the present because this is where he is, and this is where grace is available for us right now in the present. That real moment, we have to know that his presence is covenant love. The fact that he lives inside of me was not my own doing. Yes, I may have said a prayer and said, Jesus, I invite you in my heart. That may have been the way I got saved. But you know something? It was his doing. It was his doing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, I believe it, it says that, that it's because of him that we are in Christ. It's because he's the one that did it. He put us there. He put us in Christ and Christ inside of us. And Christ and us are in God. He did that. That's something that we couldn't possibly do. And know that his presence is genuine covenant love. We've talked about covenant love and what covenant love is. Covenant love is God swearing upon himself that he would keep the covenant. That everything that he said, everything that he promised, every bit of the inheritance, he said, I will do this. I will do this. That's covenant love. He said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to. I know how you feel right now. Right now, I think about that poor grieving family and how they must feel. But you know something? God hasn't left them. God isn't about to leave them. God is right there in the midst of their pain and their sorrow. He's right in the midst of that darkness, and he's working it out from the inside out. And that picture of the psalmist panting for water, being ridiculed and mocked by his enemies, 
being tormented. He's two, two times in the psalm he says that they would purposely come to him and say, where's your God? Where's your God? Have you ever had someone do something like that? You know, something goes terribly wrong, and they say, oh, I thought you had a God. But if you had a God, they wouldn't have let that happen. See, because that's their understanding of the thing. Well, well, he's being tormented by that. I mean, he says two times, he says, you know, this is the thing that really, in essence, he's saying, this is what really gets under my nerve. I know that there is a God. I know that somewhere in all of this, he's working. But from their viewpoint, they're saying that God doesn't exist. And now they're tormenting me by saying, well, where's your God? If you had a God, this wouldn't be happening to you. But in the midst of this, I want you to understand one thing. Now, it's not overt, but it's implied what he does in the midst of all this. He stands still. Did you hear what I said? He's not, oh, no, my God is real. You, you know, no, I know God is real. And, 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 no, it says that he stands still. You see, in Exodus 14, 13 and 14, the Israelites were up against the wall. They had a mountain on the left, and they had a mountain on the right, and they had the Red Sea in front of them, and they had Pharaoh pursuing them from the back. And they were right up against the sea, couldn't run to the left, it was a mountain, couldn't run to the right, it's a mountain, couldn't go back that way, here's Pharaoh and his, and his army coming down on him. And they were ready to stone Moses. They said, well, what? There wasn't enough graves in, 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 in Egypt. You had to bring us out here. This is why we told you we didn't want to go. So you know what God told Moses to say to the people in that frightful situation? He says, you tell them to be still. Be still and see the salvation of the Lord. You see, sometimes this stuff, call me, call my personality or, or, or your personality, can get in the way of what God is trying to do. Sometimes the best thing that you can do to help God is to get out of the way. And sometimes the best way you can help God is to just not do anything. Do you understand? Be still. You see, this psalmist, he was panting, he was longing for God, but you know what? He was still. You see that word uh, that was used there in Exodus 14 for being still? And today you get a Hebrew lesson. It's the word amad. Say that with me. Amad. And it means to be still. To stand still. You know, I, uh, I have a good friend and he lives upstate New York and they have deer that run all over the place, over their property. And he said he was out, and he was, uh, he was trimming up some, some shrubs. And as he's trimming the shrubs, he saw this leg right next to him of a little tiny doe. And he realized, I've been, I've been out here for 20 minutes, and this, 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 this doe hasn't moved. You see, that doe had an instinct. He knew that if he just stood still, that nothing would happen to him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes the best thing that we can do in a situation that we don't understand, sometimes the best thing that we can do in a situation where we're face to face with hopelessness, sometimes the best thing that we can do is to be still. God said to the people, he said, says, look, Moses, just tell them to stand still because this is my job. Stand still and see the great salvation of the Lord. You see, in those very same people, a little while later, they were dancing around and they were happy because God did exactly what he said he was going to do. He saved them. He did something totally, the, 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 one of the biggest miracles in the Bible. He, he separated the sea. You understand that? That really genuinely happened. He separated the sea and they walked through, not in mud and muck, but they walked through on dry land. And you know why? 
because they had to get to a place where they could stand still and see the great salvation of the Lord. Now, to really understand some of the Hebrew words, and, and I told, we've, we've talked about this before, you have to go back to the first time in the Bible that the word was used. Now, the first time that word Ahmad was used, it was used in Exodus again. And it was when Miriam, Moses' mother, realized that they were coming around and killing all the Hebrew babies, so she made this, uh, this little basket out of bulrushes, and she put tar on the bottom of it so it would float, and she put the little baby in this and, and covered it up. Well, I don't know if it had a cover. In the movie, it had a cover. <laughs> but, and and, and, and she, put it, she put it in the Nile. She put it in the Nile River. But the Bible says that Moses' older sister Miriam, is, and it uses this word Ahmad. It means that, that from a distance, she stood. Now think about this. She's watching her little brother in a makeshift boat floating down the Nile, maybe never to see him again. And I'm sure that a lot of things went through her mind at that time. Like, maybe I'll just grab it out and figure out how to save him myself if this is all my mom can come up with. But you know what she did? The Bible says that she stood still. From a distance, she just kind of watched. She watched that thing float through the water, and she stood still. She probably held the impulse to go and grab her brother. And the Bible says that it floated down, and, and a little bit further down, it floated right into the place where Pharaoh's daughter was. And she happened to be out taking a happen. She happened to be taking a bath in the Nile River, and she sees this thing, and she says, oh, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Oh, I look at him. And then Miriam comes out of the bush, and she says, do you want me to go get a Hebrew to a Hebrew lady to take care of him? She says, yeah, yeah, go get her. So, so she went and got the mother of the child, okay, to take care of him. So you see, God had that all the time. All she had to do was to stand still. Ahmad, stand still. We need to learn when we're faced with impossible situations. You know, I always say when you're faced with something that's too big for you and, it's, and you can't do anything about it, okay, God's got it. You can't, you, if you can't do anything about it, let God take care of it. Stand still. Still, let him do it. And listen, folks, that's not easy. We're a people that like to do, do, do. The more we do, the better we feel. But the problem with that is, is that we can get in the way so easy. God could be doing something. Fa can you imagine if, 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 if the Hebrew people would have turned around and ran to Pharaoh and said, okay, Pharaoh, please take us back in slavery. There would have been no great miracle. They had to stand still. They had to. You see, to stand still is to take your place as a real person in Christ. You in Christ and Christ in you. You see, when, when I'm able to stand still and, and everything about me is telling me to fight, to run, to do something, to change things around, when I can stand still in that position, then that means that I am secure in who I am. I'm secure that I'm in Christ, and he's got me, and that, 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 that he's inside of me, and anything that I'm going through, he's going through too, and it's going to work out. If I don't see how it's going to work out, if it doesn't look like it's going to work out, if it doesn't feel like it's going to work out, then I have to just stand still and wait until it works out. I have to believe that it's going to work out. To stand still... It's taking your place as a real person in Christ. You in Christ and Christ in you. To stand still is to cease from action. And that's hard. As I said before, we're a people that like to do. We're a people that like to figure stuff out. We're a people that like to solve problems. But there are some times and there are some problems that we just can't solve. And those are the times that we need to learn to stand still. When we direct our hearts and minds to truth, the truth that Triune God is with us and that Triune God is in us, it's like, it's like when Jesus spoke to the storm, it's like our raging imaginations and our raging feelings, all those, those waves that are coming up, it's like when he spoke to those storms, they all just like calm down. He said, peace be still, 
and the, con- the, the, the peace of God just settled over the, entire, over the entire sea. And that's what it's like. You see, when our hearts and our minds are not all over the place, when we're not being double-minded, when we're not saying, God, I know you're going to work this out, but God, I don't know how you're going to work this out. God, how are you going to work this out? When we are singularly looking and saying, God, you're going to work this out. When our hearts and our minds are in line with triune God, it's like the, the, the storms and the seas just, just, just smooth out. They just, they just stop. Peace be still. And they stop. And you know, hope is expectancy. Our hope is expectancy. So when we look with hope, it's not, I hope it's not that bad. It's, I expect something good to come out of this. I don't know how, but I know God, and he knows how. So I expect something good to come out of this. So we don't try to hope. We trust in and participate in his hope. Do you understand? I don't have to try to hope enough to, to, to somehow change the situation. What I do is I trust in his trust, and I participate in his hope. See, his hope is big enough for me. His hope is strong enough for me. As we trust in him, the Holy Spirit will give you his faith, his hope. We read about this two weeks ago in Romans 15, 13. You remember? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Why? So that you may overflow with hope. Your hope? No, his hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. So be still. But also, in verse 6, the psalmist did something else. Verse 6 of Psalm 42, not only was he still, but he remembered. Verse 6, he says, oh, my God, my soul is in despair within me. Oh, my God, my soul's all over the place. Oh, my God, all this stuff is happening to. Therefore... Therefore, because my soul was all over the place, because they were saying to me, where's my God? Because everything seemingly was hopeless, therefore, I remember you. We talked about this. I remember you from the land of Jordan. Then he goes on to talk about being in the temple. You see, we talked about what it is to forget. And forget in the Bible is never amnesia. Forgetting in the Bible is not, I can't remember my pen number. Forgetting in the Bible means this. It means to to, to consciously leave behind, consciously leave behind something in the past as opposed to bringing it into the future, treating it as though it has no value whatsoever in your present situation. So that's like saying, well, I know that God is mighty to save, but in this situation, I'm I'm, I'm not going there. Do you understand? That's what it's like. Remember. Don't forget. You remember what David said? Bless the Lord, O my soul. We talked about this last week. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. All of his benefits. If you know the goodness of the Lord, keep it in the forefront of your mind. Don't forget it. Don't face a new situation and say, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. You've chosen to forget who God is. You've consciously chosen not to bring him into the situation. Remember. And remember what Jeremiah said in Lamentations. I think it was 321. Let 
he was lamenting about Jerusalem and all the woes and all the problems. And then it's like, it's like God just slapped him. And he says, this I recall to mind. All of a sudden, he did what? He remembered. He says, therefore, I have hope. He's going on and on about all the hopelessness, but then he remembered who God was, and he says, therefore, I have expectation of a good end. He said, the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassion never fails. There are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, how did he get to that place? He had to remember. See, it was in there. Do you understand? It's in there. But he chose consciously to remember it. He said, wait a minute. I remember who God is. His mercies are never failing. Great is his faithfulness. He's not faithless. Great is his faithfulness. So be present in hope, be still, remember who you serve, and most important, did you notice that the author of this psalm speaks to himself? Verse 5. In verse 5, he says, He's talking to himself. He's saying, why are you in despair, oh my soul? He's asking himself a question. You know, you can do that. You can ask yourself a question. You have the right and the authority to do that. Do you have any idea how powerful your voice is? You're an image bearer of God. You bear the image of God. Do you know that God spoke the universe into existence with his voice? That means the voice of God went out into a vast emptiness with nothing there. There wasn't anything there to work with. His voice went out, and a second later, everything that he said was there. He said, let there be light, and light came. He said, let there be dry land, and dry land came. Let there be a sky, and the sky came. Now, guess what? You bear God's image. Do you know that human beings, image bearers of God, are the only creature in the universe with the ability to speak? Have you ever seen an ape speak? No, because they can't. They're a created being. They weren't created in the image of God. Okay, you got parrots, they mimic, they mimic what they hear, but they're not speaking. Human beings are the only ones in the universe that have the ability to speak. And your ability to speak is powerful. When you speak to yourself, you have, here we go with the numbers again, I think it's 30 billion cells in the average body. And when you speak to yourself, your voice reverberates, vibrates through every cell in your body. Do you hear what I say? Every cell in your body hears what you're saying, ready to respond with what you're telling it to do. I used to hear people say, well, I told that coal to get out of me, and I'm fine. I said, but you know what? <laughs> After careful study, it's like, you know, coal, leave. <laughs> and it goes. You know why? Because there's authority in your voice. It is. It's true. I mean, you guys are looking at me like I got two heads. That's okay, you know. You need to speak to yourself. When you're, when you're in a hopeless situation, you need to speak to yourself. Listen, you know enough scripture to talk to yourself. You know enough scripture to speak it over yourself, and you can do that. Do you understand that? Remember we talked about the Lord is my and we said what he was really saying is, I am is mine. Yeah. Let me tell you, you can speak that over yourself when you're in a hopeless situation. Right. You can say, I am is my life uh -huh. and my salvation. Who should I fear? Uh -huh. You can say, I am. He is my shield. 
He's my rock. And you can fill in the blanks. It doesn't have to come out. You know, he's everything that I need. You can say that, folks. Listen, wake up to who we are. Th listen, this isn't who you're going to be one day. This is who you are right now. This is the only present time that you know. This is the only reality you know right now, this moment. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow's there and we might make it. But the only thing we know is right now, and this is where God operates right now. And yes, you can speak to yourself. You can speak to yourself. You can say, you know what? I know what they think is going to happen, but that's not going to be the way it's going to end. I'm going to walk out of this place, and I'm going to walk out of this, I'm going to walk out of this hospital, and I'm going to walk out of this hospital on my own strength, breathing and walking. And if I can't get a cab, I'll walk home. You can say that. That's right. You can say that. That's right. And guess what? You may even surprise yourself as you walk into your house by yourself. Pastor Frank, you're really going out on a limb this time. Good. I need to get you out of your comfort zone. Make the choice to be present to hope. Now, you know, the reason that we went this way today is because, you know, in the midst of us talking about the fullness of God, and in the midst of us talking about just uh, growing in the grace of God, you have to know that this stuff is real, folks. It's for real situations. We live in a real world. We don't live in a world where we draw a petition like some people do, and, and this is church, but this is the real world. No, listen, listen. We're in union with Christ. You know what that means? That means that you're united with Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That means that everything that goes on in your life, God is involved in it. That's right. Everything that goes on, he's involved in it. He's at our, listen, listen, he's there because he wants to be in our life. He, he, he wants us to show him in everything that we do. Do you understand? And because of that, he wants to be involved in everything. And he is there. So you know what? He's here. He's for you. When you're going through something, God doesn't say, well, you know, when you work that out, I'll be back. No. No. Let me tell you something. In your darkest hour, when you're going through something, you feel like you're all alone. You know that Father, Son, and Spirit is in the middle of that darkness, working it out from the inside out. When you see nothing but despair, he's in here working that out. And he's waiting for you to realize, listen, I'm not, I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving you. I'm not going to forsake you. Why? Because of that? No. No, we're getting through this. All you have to do is to, is, to, is to realize who I am in the midst of this, and let's get out of here. That's what he's saying. You know, 